we were deplatformed from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter within hours. To all Americans, we say, we will be fooled no longer. The tiny emperor has no clothes. One year ago, they tried to censor the truth, but we stood tall and refused to be silenced. And the truth remains alive. Get ready for a repeat of the viral press conference that rattled the world. America's Frontline Doctors presents White Coat Summit, the one-year anniversary. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Lee Merritt. For 35 years of my life, I was in pretty much solo private practice of orthopedics and spinal surgery. And I, I retired mostly and moved back to my home Midwestern state. I'm the only person to retire from Arizona back to the Midwest. And uh, then we had all this COVID nonsense come out and I was asked to go down to the city council and argue against the mask mandate. And I thought, well, this should be a slam dunk because everybody, this is stupid. I, know, I can't even believe, I can't believe Nebraska is doing this. So we're kind of a common sense state, right? So I went down with my friends and uh, I found out the entire University of Nebraska was stacked up against us, pro-mask mandate, all the big guys, the, 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 the epidemiologists and the virologists, they were all there to tell us how we really, really needed this mask mandate. Well, I had my little three, after sitting there for five hours, I had my little three minutes, and I just remembered the one thing I said was, anybody who believes in masks is either, are either being paid or they're being played. And somehow that kind of got circulated around, and one day I was driving home from work and I heard myself giving, I turned on the radio and then I heard myself speaking back at me. I said, what's going on? And I was on the Alex Jones show. That was like his opening two minutes. <laughs> but, <laughs> crazy. It was one of those crazy things. But what happened was then I got a call from Dr. Simone Gold about coming to speak about masks at the AFLDS meeting. And um, I'm here as a proud member of AFLDS now for this long, this long year. And I hope next year we can be here to celebrate our victory, not be, not be still fighting. But this has been, thank you. Uh, we will, we're gonna win. But I wanna just say how much I've appreciated uh, being a member of AFLDS and how much it makes a difference to going forward and knowing you have a group that's with you. And, um, and, and they've done just, just some great stuff. And I've met so many wonderful doctors and now friends. Um, so I've been asked to talk about VAERS, and I, I wanted to talk first a little bit about why we have VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System that you've already heard somewhat about. You know, years ago, um, in my lifetime, I'm kind of an old fart, in 1957, a drug called thalidomide came onto the market, especially in Europe. And some of us remember that. Now, I remember this because of what it did. We saw this in orthopedics. But thalidomide was a drug that was first used for sedation and anxiety. But, but an Australian OBGYN doctor discovered it was really good for morning sickness. And so he wrote some papers and people started using it all over the world essentially for morning sickness. And it worked very well. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to them at the time, it was causing severe birth defects and some other things. It was also causing fetal death that you never really hear too much about. But what was colorful was the type of birth defect. People, little babies were being born without a finger or without a leg or without an arm. Or in the most extreme cases, we got a new syndrome. It was called the flipper hands, where your hands, you, you focomelia, where you have no long bones in your arms and your hands are attached to your shoulders. So it was very, it was very, very obvious, but it was not obvious for a while what was going on. Because when any bad drug comes on the market, and, and vaccines are, should be included in that, drugs, they separate drugs from vaccines at the FDA, but really, we're talking about all of them. When something like that comes on the market, and we've taken many drugs and many vaccines off the market for reasons, the problems. Well, when a drug comes on the market that subsequently gives us problems, it starts like a little avalanche. You know, it's, there's a little snowball at the top of the mountain and nobody sees it. In fact, most people don't see it as it rolls down the mountain until it really gains up enough speed until it's a big, now the snow is coming at you and it's too late to stop it. And that's what happened with thalidomide. By the time they got it stopped in 1961, at least 10,000 babies had been injured and probably many more that we never hear about. And the reason it took so long to stop it was because you know, a doctor might see a baby with a missing limb over here in Spain, and another one in Australia, and another one in Kansas City. And they were, at first, they're spread out. So the doctors are not talking to each other at those distances, and we can't get a picture of what's going on. Well, in the age of the internet, the idea was, here's an opportunity to stop that. We have all these childhood vaccine injuries now happening. Maybe we could get a handle on this. Let's start a, an internet 
site so that we can collate the data and stop these things earliest. And this is, this is actually the, uh, the, the, what it's written in the VAERS, in the CDC uh, site, at the goals of VAERS. It says that, we're, that they're there to detect new, unusual, or rare adverse events and to watch for unexpected or unusual patterns. Now, there's some other things they say, but those are the two biggies that pertain to what I'm going to say today. So keep those in mind. Now, about, I don't know, it was February or maybe it was the very first part of March. I think it was in February that there was a doctor, he was an OBGYN doctor, 56-year-old, perfectly healthy guy in Florida. And he died of what's called thrombocytopenia. Now, we have a disease of thrombocytopenia, a couple types that we see, but this was not that. What happened is he took the Pfizer vaccine and then four days later started having some spontaneous bleeding. He got a blood study. He had zero platelets, platelets being the little parts of your blood that like, act like little corks that stop up the holes in your artery and your veins so you don't bleed out. He had zero. That's not something we see. We see, we see people that develop low platelets. They start to bleed. We can temporize. We can give them platelet injections. We can do things for them to, to slow this down to try and figure it out, and many people resolve, right? Well, this guy went on to die at day 12 of a huge brain bleed. Now, this was a doctor in his own hospital. Trust me, they had teams of people trying to figure this out and working with this guy, and they could not save this guy's life. And so that kind of perked my ears up. Then I, I kind of waited to see if we saw any more of these. I saw 37 other cases that were reported in the mainstream media you know, of similar cases around the world. So then I said, somebody needs to be looking at this. So I decided to learn how to use VAERS and start to look at this. And I, I pulled out, I found 94 cases reported in VAERS, very similar to this doctor. Some, some not quite the same ex, ex, d, um, degree of platelet depletion, but, but very, very similar, many deaths. And of all ages, it wasn't just older people. So I, I tried to publish a paper. I put it all together like a scientific paper. I sent it into a, a, a standard medical journal, and of course it was rejected without even much, much thought. I did publish it in the uh, Journal of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. It's have been a bulwark of, of, this, of getting information out that we should know. And, um, and subsequently, I've started looking at VAERS for lots of things. And so what I thought I would show you today is some of, the, some of what we know just from looking at everyday stuff in VAERS. Now, here's, you'll hear criticisms of VAERS, oh, it's not put in by doctors and nurses. Well, that may be true, but actually that's to our benefit because it, they're too busy lots of times to put it in or they don't even know about the system. I saw a patient that was very severely injured not too long ago from the vaccine that was not my patient, it was someone else's, and I was consulting, and I said, you should really put this into VAERS. This is a 63-year-old doctor said to me, what's VAERS? That's our problem. So you're not going to get it that way. So you need to have other people, the, the people that care what's going on are the family and friends, and they're doing their job. Um, the other thing to say is, it, at least, it may not be perfect. It may not already be reported. The Harvard, the Harvard study said it was 1 to 10% of adverse events were reported in the VAERS. So every time you see a number of 100, you have to multiply that times 10 to 100. But the, the point is, what we're seeing now is the same, it's the same methodology we used 10 years ago, 20 years ago, back to 1990 when VAERS started. So we should be able to see some comparisons. Now, when I look at VAERS, I just look at the United States numbers. Yes, you can get the big, you'll have here, the 10,000 deaths that you hear about recently that's been touted in VAERS, that's all areas. The problem when you use VAERS for all areas, you don't know the denominator. But I know how many people live in the United States and the, and the territory. So you can calculate that as your denominator, and here's, here are the number of adverse events. So these are the numbers from U.S. and, and U.S. territory. So if you look at all deaths between 1990 and 2021, of all the vaccines, not the COVID vaccine, but all other vaccines put together, there have been 3,885 deaths during all those years, 31 years, which is, comes to an average of 125 deaths a year. This year in COVID, for the same database, 5,063. So 125 to 5,063, that's the jump. I also looked at pulmonary embolism. Now, we're having a lot of problems, as you've heard, with blood clotting. So pulmonary embolism is a clot that goes to your lungs and can potentially kill you. In 31 years of VAERS, there were 14 reported. There are 73 reported with this, this year of COVID. Brain hemorrhage, there were 39 over 31 years. This year, 96. 
uh, myocardial infarct or heart attack. There were 75 reported over 31 years. This one, 291. And I can tell you that's a vast underestimate because every one of us, I'll bet you, knows somebody or has heard the story that so-and-so took the vaccine and woke up dead in the middle of the night. I mean, didn't get up in the morning. Do you know what I mean? Um, it, that's what's happening. 13-year-old year boy recently took the vaccine that morning, did not wake up from his sleep that night. Now, Guillain-Barre is uh, ascending paralysis, and this is the case I just saw recently. Now, Guillain-Barre is the most um, paid out uh, from, the, from the government compensation board for vaccine injury in America. It's mostly due to the flu vaccine. And over, over the 31 years, there were 3,919 cases, which averages to 130 per year. This year alone, and we're not done with the year, what are we, six months into the vaccine program? 1,432 cases of Guillain-Barre. And these are serious, this is serious, these can be serious paralysis. The woman I saw, classic story, she took the vaccine um, and you know, didn't mention this to anybody, but a week later she was starting to have trouble walking, so she asked her daughter to come over. She's 72, 73 years old, in good shape, she's living alone, no problems. But she can't get around very well, so her daughter comes to help her, and after a few days it gets worse and she can't take care of her, so she comes into the hospital. She's admitted by my partner, or my, my partner, my colleague, who, um, says, I think maybe there's a spine problem because she's complaining to me of back pain and leg weakness. This is on a Sunday. By the time I saw her on Monday, she couldn't talk to me. She couldn't open her mouth. She couldn't smile. She couldn't open her eyes. She could try. You could tell she was trying. That's, that's ascending paralysis. That's called the locked-in syndrome when you're there mentally, but you can't move. That's, that's Guillain-Barre in its worst form. Um, so uh, 1,432 of those cases so far. Thrombocytopenia now, when I, when I checked in February, it was 94 cases. Now we're up to uh, 639 cases. The average per year is 31. Myeloma, which is a, a cancer of the bone, bone marrow, that's on average 2.1 per year. We've had 44 this year. Another thing you'll notice in VAERS is a lot of tumors are cropping up. And, you know, one of my big problems is our vaccination of the military. Um, I'm a 10-year Navy surgeon, and uh, so I have Navy people and, and, and Army people calling me. Um, there were only 20 deaths of all the active duty in, tw in 2020 for COVID, 20, and all the services put together. They have a big now that they didn't have when I was in. They have a big epidemiologic base, and they can find out exactly what's going on. There were only 20 deaths. We're vaccinating everybody. And um, we've already had tumors, and we've had 80 cases of myocarditis, which I'm going to get to. But myocarditis has a, has, has a significant mortality, five-year mortality rate. I think it's 66%. So we, with the vaccine program, have ostensibly killed more of our young, young, young active duty people than COVID did. Um, leukemia, another, another uh, blood dyscrasia, cancer. There's 48 per year on average in, in VAERS. We now are up to 229. Uh, myocarditis that I just mentioned. In, in 31 years of the VAERS, there were 317 cases. Now, this year, 1,113. So, so you can see the, 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 the ongoing numbers. And I can pick almost any diagnosis, and you will find the same issues. So the question you have to ask is, why, why are we not stopping this? We stopped many things for far less. We stopped working on respiratory syncytial virus vaccine because of 22 deaths of infants in the hospital. We stopped the H1N1 after 53 deaths or 53 serious adverse events. So we are now doing 53 probably a day. Why are we continuing to move on here? Well, in my opinion, um, I think you have to look at your worldview. And this is my new, my new thing when I talk to people. I say, if you know, if you think we're fighting a virus, you're going to act like a victim. If you think we're, fight, you're, we're fighting a war, you're going to act like a warrior. And my, uh, my argument is we're in a war. Now, we have to determine. It's a fifth generation, uncharacteristic, unrestricted war. But we have to determine who the enemy is. Well, the first thing I would say is let's look at the people that have given us these, these agents. And let's look at a little history. I talked to you about thalidomide. Now, keep in mind, by the way, Dr. Mitchell gave his excellent talk showing the benefit of hydroxychloroquine in, in Africa. You know, the most, the, in 2020, I had, we had looked up these numbers uh, in, independently when we met at the AFLDS a year ago. And I, I said the, the most dangerous place to be if you have COVID was in New York State, 0.17% mortality. 
Where was the safest place to be? It was Uganda, former home of Idi Amin, because there was a 0.00003% mortality. But you know what? What's the difference in Uganda? You are free enough to walk down to the corner store and get your own hydroxychloroquine without a doctor. And we are not. We in the free state of, of America. But, but anyway, so let's look back on thalidomide. It turns out, where did thalidomide come from? I'm just going to give you a little history and then what happened to thalidomide. All this, we can't get hydroxychloroquine uh, authenticated for use in COVID, right? And in fact, let me just back up and say, I had a, a, a person told me this story about his doctor. He wanted to get some ivermectin to travel. His doctor said, um, it's, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are not approved and are not useful. They're not really should be used for uh, COVID. They're very dangerous drugs when used for that, that reason. Okay, and he said, now you are at risk of dying of COVID, but your risk of having a problem with this vaccine is far less than taking an aspirin, probably hundreds of times less than your risk of taking an aspirin. Really? You know, I would call to the doctors, read the VAERS, okay? You're not, you don't just listen to ABC News. The VAERS uh, database doesn't just tell you numbers, it tells you tragic stories. There are, uh, you can look at the analytics and you can look at the history that goes with these. You can read about the two month old baby that took a, a vaccine and died several hours later. Or the six month old infant that died after breastfeeding from a mother, she was perfectly normal breastfeed from a mother who took the second Pfizer vaccine. And he got thrombocytopenia and died, okay? Um, you know, it's on and on. The 29 year old that it works for a hospital and takes the vaccine because the hospital mandated it for their staff. And he's found dead on the floor three days later in the on-call room or in the, in the lounge. So that goes on and on. And doctors need to take the time to read that. But thalidomide has a, has a history. So thalidomide was developed by Otto Ambrose. Ambrose, starting with an A, he also developed sarin gas. He worked for IG Pharma. He was one of the, one of the um, chemists convicted after the Nuremberg trials and served eight years um, in prison. Well. While he was working at the, at the IG Farben plant at Auschwitz, he developed thalidomide. And when he got out of prison eight years after the war, he took his research to England and became a consultant to the pharmaceutical companies. Now, they took it off the market in 1961, but in 1998, it was approved for use in America. And it is now, not only, not, not only is it on the WHO list of essential medicines, but it is available as a generic in spite of a list of complications this long, and we can't get hydroxychloroquine approved. This is where we are, and this is who we're fighting. And the VAERS is a very good um, system, and all of you can learn to use it and get your own data. Thank you very much.